There's rivalries in every single sport, but when it comes to MMA, it's a little different, right? I mean, at the end of the day, these two people are actually going to throw down inside a cage, which is usually the furthest any confrontation can escalate. Now, there's been plenty of rivalries in mixed martial arts. A lot of the sport was built on some of the biggest of them, but most rivalries start for a simple reason. We're going to fight, or we've already fought. Seems pretty logical to me. But today, I've got some rivalries that started for other reasons. Bad blood that started between two guys, not because they fought each other, but for something else entirely. I'm Bailey, and from my own point, thank you as always ways to you hall of famers out there appreciate your support and these are 10 fights that started rivalries number 10 rampage versus the ninja where better to start than back in the old pride days where soccer kicks were handed out like free candy and respect was generally earned in the ring and not on the microphone Rampage Jackson had arrived in 2001 and quickly become a fan favorite as an American brawler who could also slam you unconscious. He was a force of destruction but often came up short in the big fights and after losing in the middleweight Grand Prix in 2003, he rematched Vandalay for the belt one year later but was beaten worse the second time. To bounce back, Pride booked him to fight Murillo Hua, the older brother of Shogun. Ninja and Rampage went back and forth in what turned out to be a very close split decision win for Jackson, but he even admitted post-fight that he didn't think he'd done enough to win. This fight, however, was the start of a rivalry with Ninja's little brother, Shogun. And it just so happened that three months later, when the 2005 middleweight Grand Prix got started, Rampage drew Shogun in the opening round. I mean, that definitely wasn't fixed, right? Hua had told MMA media at the time he knew Rampage was the star in Pride and he was the new guy from Brazil. He wanted to avenge his brother and establish himself as one of the new top young stars and he also said that in the end, the fight was even easier than he could imagine. Shogun attacked Rampage from the opening bell and broke his ribs early with knees to the body and it quickly turned into one of Pride's legendary beatings. Shogun avenged his brother and went on to win the whole tournament. Number 9. John Jones vs Shogun Hua Right, well, continuing the story of Shogun Hua, after he ran through everyone in Pride, minus a broken arm against Mark Coleman, Mauricio got to the UFC and in a crazy upset, immediately lost to Forrest Griffin. Still, two years later, he ended the Machida era and became the UFC champion. The number one contender at that point was pretty obvious. It was Sugar Rashad Evans. He'd just had a title eliminator with Rampage Jackson and was booked to fight Shogun at UFC 128, but then shit went down. Evans injured his knee while training and had to pull out of the fight. He was a member of the Jackson Wink Academy alongside with John Jones, both were light heavyweights, and Sugar had already been a star by the time John was just getting started in the UFC. After the news broke, Evans was out of 128, John fought Ryan Bader and finished him in the second round, and post-fight, Rogan asked if John would fill in on short notice and challenge for the belt against Hua. Considering Sugar was out, John didn't miss a beat, he jumped at the opportunity and battered Sugar on the following month and became world champion. But it kind of pissed Rashad off. That had been his title fight, his chance to win back the belt, and his teammate had just walked right past him and stolen his glory. Your fabric is fake. Tell me how my fabric You know is. I know. You know, I know that you know? Oh yeah. Rashad ended up leaving the Jackson Wink team over it, and the bad blood just built and built. Finally, they got to fight, and John dominated across five rounds, but in recent years, Evans has even called John the GOAT. Number 8. Satoru Kitaoka vs Mizuto Hirota Back in the day, Japanese MMA was entirely its own product. From Shuto to Pride, then Dream, they had their own stars, and although it occasionally crossed over with US MMA, it had its own personality and, of course, rivalries. Most of you will know who Shinya Aoki is, especially if you saw the documentary video I made about him, or maybe you've just seen that iconic image of him flipping off his opponent after breaking his arm. Well, that all started in a completely different organization. At the time, the two biggest Japanese promotions were Dream and Sengoku. Aoki's longtime friend and training partner, Satoru Kitaoka, was the Sengoku lightweight champion. He'd just beaten Takanori Gomi to win the belt, and at the same time, Aoki was a dream champion. Best friends, holding world titles, what could go wrong? Another Japanese star, Mizuto Hirota, stepped up and faced Kitaoka. Oka for the Sengoku world title. It was a pretty wild fight, and Hirota ended up finishing him with some brutal knees. Understandably, this made Shinya Aoki pretty damn upset, and it just so happened that the next Dream event was set to be a massive one, with seven fighters from Dream going up against seven fighters from Sengoku, and guess who was headlining? That's right, Aoki versus Hirota in a truly bad blood matchup. After a show so good you couldn't write it, it was tied four wins for Sengoku and four for Dream going into the final matchup, and Aoki versus Hirota would decide which promotion would win the entire night. Shinya wanted revenge for his teammate, and he got it, hammerlocking Hirota, who refused to tap. So yeah, Aoki broke that shit and then flipped him off in front of the entire Saitama Super Arena. 
Number seven, Michael Chandler versus the Pitbulls. After Iron Mike had basically appeared out of nowhere and run through the Bellator lightweight tournament, he beat Eddie Alvarez in a crazy upset and he became the new champion. And he had to beat a lot of top talent on the way, including Patricky Pitbull, who was undefeated in Bellator at the time and Mike took the W by decision. Flash forward a few years though and Mike had lost the belt and his chance to win it back against Will Brooks. He put two more wins on his record and Mike and Pitbull would meet to fight for the vacant lightweight title. A rematch five years in the making, only this time Iron Mike came out in the first round and knocked Patricky completely unconscious. <laughs> He did a couple of backflips and jumped on the cage right in front of Patricky's younger brother, Patricio, who was, of course, very fucking upset and started pointing and shouting at Chandler that he was next. It was a start of a great rivalry between Chandler and the Pitbull family. They continued to go back and forth until two years later, after Mike had won back the lightweight title for a third time, it just so happened that Patricio was the featherweight champion, and so a champ-champ fight was made in Bellator with a heated rivalry going alongside of it. In fact, it was Patricio who would get revenge for his brother, however, as he repaid the favor TKOing Chandler in the first round. Great rivalry, and honestly, great performance from Patricio in honor of his fallen brother. Number six, Betch Cahaya versus Jessamine Duke. Back when women's divisions were just getting started in MMA, there honestly wasn't a lot of storylines going on. Some of the old rivalries like Misha and Ronda had carried over from Strike Force, but for the rest of the division, they were all just getting started, really. But Betch Kohea actually had a pretty cool idea. Following the Ultimate Fighter season, Ronda Rousey had started her own girl squad, calling themselves the Four Horsewomen of MMA, after the pro wrestling team, apparently, I mean, I don't fucking know. The point was that was Ronda's squad, and Betch knew that going into her fight with one of those girls, Jessamine Duke. Betch ran around the cage and after taking the win, held up her four fingers and put one down, indicating that she was on a mission to take out these four horsewomen of MMA. She got her wish and fought Shayna Baszler next, and after this time TKOing her in the second round, she made the same gesture, two down, and considering the third wasn't actually in the UFC, only Ronda Rousey was next. She had to wait a year to get a title shot, but she was matched up with Ronda in Brazil. The build-up and bad blood got pretty nasty. She even made a joke about Ronda not doing something serious after she lost inside the cage, which was also a reference to Rousey's late father. At the stare down, Betch told her not to cry, but Ronda ended up knocking her out in 34 seconds and then turned around and said it right back to her. Pretty good rivalry for the time, this one. Number five, Jake Shields versus Ray Cooper. There's been a few examples so far of teammates getting revenge for fallen comrades and even brothers who got to avenge each other, but in a pretty rare situation, we have seen a son get to fight a guy who beat his dad. It's no secret Jake Shields has been around for a long time in MMA. He started in 1999 and didn't retire until 2018 with his final fight in the PFL. The first five years of his career, he traveled all over seeking competition and considering Japanese MMA was pretty big at the time, he, along with the rest of the scrap pack, ended up in Shuto. Before making the trip, however, Jake had taken a fight at Warriors Quest in Hawaii against Ray Cooper, an island native who'd been competing in MMA as early as 1997. Ray didn't have the best record, but he managed to armbar Antonio McKee in the first round, and against Jake, he took him to a majority decision. The two men met again when Shuso came to Hawaii for a special event, and they put Jake and Ray in the main event for the welterweight title, and this time, Shield submitted Ray in the first round. Jake would go on to have immense success outside of the UFC, while Ray retired just a few years later. But after a very long career, Jake found himself on the PFL roster with none other than Ray Cooper's son, Ray Cooper III. It was a matchup too good not to make. Jake had ruined Ray's dad's chance of winning a title, and he took revenge, TKOing him in the second round. They even matched up again in the welterweight tournament a few months later, and this time Ray put him away in the first round. Not many men get the chance to take out a guy who'd beaten their dad, but it's a nice bit of MMA history for you. Actually, speaking of MMA history, number four, Euclides Hatem versus George Gracie. If you don't know the difference between Brazilian martial arts Lucha Livre and Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, it spans more than just technique. It even comes down to social class. Apart from Lucha Livre literally translating to wrestling in English and being born from catch wrestling, it is about submission first instead of position, kind of the opposite of BJJ. But if you wanted to train with the Gracies and learn their martial art, you needed one very important thing, a gi. And believe it or not, not everyone in Brazil had the money to buy one. All the regular people, they trained Luta Livre. Euclides Hatem had started the movement in Brazil and he'd been virtually unbeatable in the 1930s. By 1942, though, the rivalry between the two arts had grown and Hatem took on George Gracie, submitting him with a rear naked choke, igniting a rivalry that would last for decades. Things intensified over the next few years with rival gyms fighting each other and on occasion storming dojos. Things really went up a notch though when Hickson Gracie and Luta Livre legend Hugo Duarte got into a brawl on a beach in Rio. They had been scheduled to fight but Hickson didn't want to wait and decided to confront him. 
Hickson said, look, I'm going to go there, slap him on the face, and he's going to run. <laughs> he goes there, slap the guy, and the guy did not run. Hickson pretty much beat him up, and they had a rematch in a parking lot later, but it all came to a clash in 1991 when they organized a massive martial arts event live on TV in Brazil, Desafio Jiu-Jitsu vs. Luta Livre. It came down to three bouts with Luta Livre vs. Jiu-Jitsu fighters, and all three BJJ guys won. And although it was pretty much absolute chaos, things died down after that, but the rivalry continued pretty much all starting back in 1942. Number 3. Tito Ortiz vs. Guy Mezca UFC 13 gave birth to a lot of future stars. Randy Couture made his UFC debut, Vitor Belfort, TKO Tank Abbott, and Tito Ortiz fought while still in college, so he didn't get paid a single cent. Isn't that, like, a crime? To make things worse, in the second round, he went up against a seriously tough and way more experienced guy, Mezcat, and although he took him down, a bad ref's call broke up the action and stood them up, but didn't restart the fight on the ground, and then a few seconds later, Ortiz dived into a Mezcat guillotine. Tito was obviously pretty upset, but he got his chance for revenge against Guy's team, the Lions Den, when he faced Jerry Bolander at UFC 18. That fight was stopped because of a cut. In celebration, Tito pulled out the double pistols and shot him at the Lions Den corner team, and he was also wearing that weird t shirt. What is that? What the fuck is that? You could tell Shamrock was pretty pissed about the whole situation, and at the very next UFC show, Tito was back to rematch Guy Mezca. This time, he TKO'd Guy and gave the Lions Den team the finger guns once again. He then slipped on a shirt that said, Gay Mezca is my bitch, all before getting into a shouting match with Ken Cageside. After this, it was basically on with Tito versus Ken Shamrock in a rivalry that spanned the next seven years with three fights, all of which Tito won, and a very hilarious season of The Ultimate Fighter. Number 2. Dominic Cruz vs Uriah Faber 1 Let's take a little trip back to the good old days of the WEC. Before the UFC had the featherweight and bantamweight divisions, the WEC had all the best guys in the world at those weight classes, and there was no one better than Uriah Faber. He was their biggest star, one of the pound for pound best on the planet, and in his second title defense he took on the undefeated Dom Cruz, but pretty much no one knew who Dominic was. He had a famous quote before the event that he knew who he was fighting, everyone knows Faber, but he has no idea who I am, I'm not even on the poster, and he bloody wasn't. It was Eddie Wineland who introduced Dom to Faber at the start of fight week. Uriah pretty nonchalantly said, oh, you're the guy I'm fighting. And it was that exact moment that would start a decade-long rivalry, not just with Faber, but his entire team. Faber tapped Dom in the first round with his patented guillotine, and that would be the only loss on his career for the next 10 years. Dom bounced back into the rankings and took revenge two years later when he beat Faber's teammate Joseph Benavidez twice, in fact. And actually, the next four wins Dom had would all be against guys who at one point trained at Faber's gym, Alpha Male. He eventually rematched Faber in the UFC four years after their first fight, and Dom got his revenge, taking a unanimous decision and keeping Uriah from winning the bantamweight title. The rivalry would continue to Dom's fight with TJ Dillashaw, who was a homegrown talent Uriah had recruited out of high school, and Dom beat him as well. Cruz and Faber even rematched after that, and Dom still stayed unbeaten against Team Alpha Male. It was Cruz's fight with Cody Garbrandt, though, that put an end to the rivalry, but the bad blood between Dom and Alpha Male had reached a boiling point by then. Cody had been just 15 when Dom and Faber fought for the first time, and he'd essentially been trained his entire MMA career to beat that man. He put on a performance of a lifetime, and the Cruz Alpha Male saga finally came full circle. Number 1. Elio Gracie vs. Masahiko Kimura after Mitsuyu Maeda had traveled from Japan to Brazil to teach his own particular form of judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu was born, and the Brazilians totally made it their own, with Elio Gracie being one of the founding members of the art form. But that in turn led to a rivalry between judo and BJJ, and by 1951, people wanted answers as to what martial art was superior. When Japanese black belt Kimura arrived in Brazil with his judo troupe, the newspapers hailed him as the world's jiu-jitsu champion, knowing it would stir things up with the Gracies. Elio then challenged him to a match, but demanded Kimura fight one of their weakest members first to prove himself. In response, Kimura demanded Elio fight one of their lowest ranking members, and Elio accepted and took on Yukio Kato. Now these two went back and forth, but ultimately it all ended in controversy, when being tangled in the ropes led to Elio putting Kato to sleep. Kimura then stepped up and challenged Elio himself. The Japanese embassy even said he wouldn't be welcomed back if he lost. But in 1951, in front of 20,000 people, Kimura put on an absolute clinic and eventually broke Elio's arm. This judo move he used was renamed the Kimura, and it started a lifelong rivalry. The match reset 
surfaced in 1992 when the Gracies in Action documentary was released, but apparently it wasn't telling the whole truth. The size difference between the two men was exaggerated, as was the stipulations around who was declared the winner. This reignited the rivalry, and Japanese pro wrestler Satoru Sayama hosted Valet Tudo Japan in 1994, an event that Hicks and Gracie would win, taking out all three of his opponents. That led to Nobuhiko Takada issuing challenges to the Gracies and sending Yoji Anjo to their gym to challenge them, where he was promptly destroyed by Hickson. Takada was expected to seek revenge, and so a little organization known as Pride FC was established so Hickson and Takada could settle the score. At Pride 1, Hickson armbar Takada, but the rivalry wouldn't die there. He would even later go on to fight Hoist Gracie. But it was Sakuraba who would be known as the Gracie Hunter as he took out family member after family member looking to restore honor for Japan and the wrestlers. It had all begun long ago in the 1950s and led to one of the biggest MMA organizations in the world. Pretty interesting one today, a bunch of stories there you probably wouldn't have heard of. Go and tell your MMA friends something they don't know. Gotta give a shout out to Max Randall for editing this video as well. Thank you, Max. You can check him out at Max underscore Randall, or you can go check out his new channel, The Combat Arcade. Always appreciate Max. Channel champions, thank you once again for all your support. You get plenty of benefits if you join the membership program here at MMA On Point. You want to support the channel a little bit more, help us out a little bit, and get something in return. All the details down below in the channel champions members section. Which rivalry was your favorite? Favorite. There was a bunch of good ones. Well, you can leave us a comment down below and give your thoughts and whatever else. Give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you're not subscribed here. There's plenty of stuff coming your way, but I'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much.